Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, LSE Spring 2020 uh, Colloquium Series. My name is Dominique Brossard. I'm professor and chair in the Department of Life Sciences Communication. And it's my pleasure today to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Jennifer Frazee. Jennifer has been a scientist and curator at the Exploratorium in San Francisco since 2004 and focuses on bringing new areas of biology to the public. She was one of the two of the co curator of the Exploratorium New East Gallery, spearheading new exhibits on microscopic life in the oceans, plankton. Jennifer has a PhD in cell biology from UC San Francisco and a BS in genetics and bioethics from the University of California, Davis. Before coming to the Exploratorium, she worked at the National Academy of Science and PBS. She has been an NSF fellow, a Triple S mass media fellow, and has won the NSF Triple S Scientific Visualization Challenge. So please join me virtually in welcoming Jen. I really appreciate Dominique inviting me and Claire for all of her encouragement and support on the technical back end, but. I'm a huge fan of the work you all are doing and I'm really honored to present to you today, even if it's not in person. So let me start sharing my screen here. All right, so today, uh, as Dominique said, uh, I work in a science museum. And so I'm gonna be focusing on talking about ways to engage the public with science in museums. Uh, and that's my Twitter handle if anybody wants to follow me. I, I, I try to put up things about science communication and museums. And I'm going to be talking about work uh, funded by the National Science Foundation and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the museum context, which might be a little bit different from the kinds of science communication you're normally thinking about. I'm going to talk about how to communicate with exhibits themselves. And uh, Claire mentioned that many of you are scientists. And I'm going to talk a little bit about opportunities for scientists to engage in communication in museums so that you might be able to start practicing yourselves. So I think when a lot of people think of science communication, they think of a more traditional forms of media. And I know a lot of us right now are engaging with these forms, you know, newspapers, news, documentary, film, books. So these are all incredible ways to communicate and I think they are the ways that we normally think of as communication, you know, journalism, books, films. But I think what I want people to think about, the context I'm coming from, is a museum, which in this case is the Exploratorium. Uh, we're a science museum that's been around for 50 years and is much more hands-on. And almost everything we do is focused on science in different ways that I'll talk about today. Now, our museum has about 900,000 visitors a year, uh, and much, much more than that online and in teacher programs. But that's sort of the, the general context. And I wanted to start by sort of exploring some of the ways that science museums can be different in engaging with people than those more traditional forms of media. So museums give people an opportunity to actually see the artifacts of science or actual objects. And in this case, you know, there's a a wonderful a daughter and father looking at some sort of fossilized skeleton, but you can imagine museums are places you can actually go see sort of like evidence of science, artifacts, objects. There are also places where the public can use real scientific tools. This is an image of our microscope imaging station, which is a research grade microscopes that have been outfitted with controls. So visitors can look at live specimens like stem cells, zebrafish embryos. So this is something, you know, they wouldn't really be able to do at home that they can do in a museum. You can actually do something social. You can interact with a friend or family member and use real physical things to test your ideas. Well, what if I swing this pendulum before you swing that pendulum? You can actually like be social, do things that are physical, and you can interact with real scientists. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but Science museums are actually a place where, you know, a lot of the general public don't actually know scientists, practicing scientists, and museums can be a place where they actually have an opportunity to engage with practicing research scientists. And in this case, this was a researcher from Stanford that was working with us to do demos. Uh, they also, I'm going to talk less about this today, but one thing I wanted to note is that 
museums, because they are physical places, also allow people to be part of immersive experiences. You know, there can be, I think these are more and more popular now, that, but, you know, sort of three-dimensional rooms, all of these quote-unquote Instagrammable moments, but, you know, planetarium shows, immersive art experiences. So it's not just something flat or static. It really can be a sort of three-dimensional immersive experience. Now, this is an image of the Smithsonian on a busy day. They actually have 5 million visitors a year to the American Museum of Natural History. Oh, sorry, not the National Museum of Natural History. But museums in the US, science museums, have over 80 million visitors a year. So this is a huge opportunity for us, not just to engage people with content, but in these artifacts, tools, and more immersive experiences with science. So that's a little bit about the museum and museum context and some of the opportunities to have different sorts of science experiences. But you, know, you can imagine that it requires a different form of communication. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we communicate with museum exhibits. And the reason I think it's a little bit different is even though it takes a lot to be an incredible New York Times journalist or to make a documentary film, there are mediums that we're more familiar with. You know, how do you grab someone with relevance? How do you write an essay? They're mediums that we're more used to as far as structuring a story we want to tell and delivering content and with a certain pace and a certain format. And museum exhibits are a little bit different than that. So before I got into how to design an exhibit, I wanted to talk about something, since a lot of you don't work in museums, uh, just some terminology. Exhibitions contain exhibits. So that may seem straightforward, but I know when I first started doing this leaving biology, it was like, wait, what's an exhibition? Well, an exhibition is a whole show. So that's an image of our recent show we opened called Cells to Self. So usually, you know, if you saw, oh, it's chocolate, there's a show on chocolate, there's a show on genomics. An exhibition is a whole show with all the walls, the designs, all, maybe there are 20 or 30 different pieces or exhibits within it. And an exhibit is an individual sort of component within an exhibition. So I'm going to focus today on exhibits because they're sort of these individual pieces we can talk about that tell a story or engage someone with a practice. But these exhibits are sort of the pieces within an exhibition. So that's just a little bit of really complicated terminology there. <laughs> so considerations when you're designing one of these exhibits. So the first is that they're unmediated. And what does this mean? This means there's no one there to help the visitor. So the visitor is, you know, our visitor to the museum. It's the general public. There's no one there like a teacher saying, oh yeah, push this button first, then read this label, then move the pendulum this way. They're not being guided. So you have to design something so that someone knows what to do without any help from a person. The second thing you have to consider, and this is actually probably the hardest thing for people to get their heads around. I mean, it, it still is hard for me sometimes. It is a very, very short interaction. So we call this dwell time, how long someone dwells at an exhibit. It usually is less than a minute. And this can vary depending on the complexity or the age of the visitor, but you really have less than one minute. So this is not a documentary film. This is not a news story where someone's going to spend three to five minutes reading it. You literally have less than a minute to get across the message or the skill that you want to convey. The third consideration is that you have an incredibly wide range of backgrounds and ages. So you, you can imagine when you've been to a museum, you know, if you're there in the morning, maybe there are preschool groups or school field trips. Um, there might be grandparents bringing their grandchildren at the Exploratorium. Hopefully this won't happen for a while. We had a lot of cruise ship visitors. <laughs> so t that tended to be on the older side. So Unlike designing an educational activity for a classroom or even something for like Nova, where I did an internship a long time ago, you actually kind of have no idea who's coming to your experience. It's all ages. We'd like more backgrounds than we tend to get. That's a different story. But, you know, there's a lot of different people coming to your museum. It's also a free choice learning environment. And by free choice, we just mean you can't control what order people are going to do the exhibits. So a lot of times when you're starting to design a show, let's say you want to talk about genetics, 
you can't say, oh, first they'll do the exhibit on DNA, then they'll do the exhibit on genes. You have no control. Someone might do you know, one exhibit before another exhibit. You can't control the order. So each piece really has to be a standalone piece. Uh, they're social, so that's fantastic, but it does take some different thinking when you design. How do you design so that one person can't interfere with another person's experience? Or how do you design so that two people can work together? So that's a consideration that not all forms of science communication have. And the last one that does come into play, and I'll talk about when I talk about prototyping, is cost. You know, so these exhibits at our museum, you know, we can have between 2,000 and 5,000 visitors a day of all ages. So these things have to be robust and they tend to be quite expensive. So you definitely want to think about, you, you want to invest wisely, um, but we'll talk about that more with the design. So how do we design these exhibits? Now I put up something that you may have all seen before if you're doing science communication. This is the AAAS, that's the publisher of science and an organization. They have a public engagement uh, framework that comes from their science communication toolkit. So I just pulled this up because it might be familiar. And I think really when you're designing any kind of engagement, you might use this general framework. You know, you're gonna plan, what's your goal? Who's your audience? You implement, you know, what's the activity, building it, writing it, whatever you're gonna do, and then evaluating. That's sort of a basic framework, uh, but museum exhibits, I wanted to sort of tease out some things that are the most unique in this sort of cycle of public engagement. So ways that museum exhibits can really differ from these other forms of communication, I sort of think of it like a stair old fashioned equalizer, you know, tuning up or tuning down different factors. I think one of the most important things, especially at the Exploratorium, a hands-on museum is when you're thinking about your goal. And for us, the goal is usually not content. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about when the goal is not content. Um, the second thing I'm gonna talk about is design. So how we use nonverbal communication. I think we're so used to thinking of using words, whether they're in a film or on paper, but what are elements that we use um, to do science communication non-verbally or, or cue visitors? And the third is when we do evaluation, it's not just at the end, we really use it throughout the process. So I'll talk a little bit about these three areas because I think they really distinguish uh, exhibit design from other forms of science communication. So I'm gonna talk about one case study to sort of tease out these three factors. And this was an NSF funded project called Living Liquid that was focused on creating visualizations for the public. So this is how we're gonna sort of unpack these three areas of communication with museum exhibits. And there were a variety, it was at the Exploratorium, but we had academic part, uh, computer science partners from UC Davis, and then our biology content and data sets were coming from University of Hawaii, MIT, and Stanford. So when the goal's not content, so the, the story sort of starts with the museum moving over the water, that's our museum, which I hope you can visit someday. Uh, it's over San Francisco Bay, and as one of the curators of life sciences, of course, I was interested in creating new kinds of life sciences experiences. So yes, there was everything has to have some sort of grounding in a, in a domain, and the domain for us was like, okay, we need to do some things about marine biology. And in this case, you know, we're not an aquarium, so, and I am a cell biologist, so I immediately gravitated toward plankton or marine microbes. Uh, and this is a micrograph I took, but there, I could spend the whole time talking about plankton because of course I love plankton, but they're beautiful single-celled organisms. They drift around in the water and they not only are the base of the marine food chain, but they produce half the oxygen we breathe. So there's actually a lot of research on, you know, when they're alive, when they grow, how climate change is affecting them. So it wasn't just, oh, we have a pretty microscopic creature for our visitors to look at. We really wanted to get into some of the new current interesting science because it was relevant to climate change and other factors. So yes, this sounds like content. It's marine biology, it's plankton. But for us in our museum, really what we focus on is not the content, but what we focus on as the practices of science. So 
when the goal is not content, we want to give the public opportunities to engage in the practice of science. And this is just a screenshot from a, the Next Generation Science Standards, which are used in classrooms, but they sort of summarize these science and engineering practices as well. I'm not going to read through all of them, but they're probably pretty familiar if you've studied the scientific method, like, you know, asking questions, developing and using models, planning and carrying out investigations, analyzing and interpreting data. So the reason I, I bring this up is that museums, far more than any other sort of informal communication like news or documentaries, we actually can engage the general public in doing science. So we're not just telling them, oh, DNA is a double-stranded helix and, oh, this is what a gene is, this is what a cell is, this is climate change. We actually, because we have them physically there, we can involve them much more in doing things that scientists do. So for our museum, this is really important to us is that we want to let people engage in the practice of science because we think that that's as important as understanding the content. So in the case of those pl the plankton, you know, it's like, okay, great, I love plankton. Well, what science and engineering practice is really important for us to be getting across at this time? And with this project, it was, you know, big data. So the, these slides are a bit outdated. And sometimes even now when I see our big data president, I feel a little, I miss him. But um, it, we, we realized at that time, you know, and I think now we're all aware that these huge data sets were really transforming science. And I think these covers illustrate that. But all this data, scientists can't analyze zeros, ones, A's, C's, T's, and G's. They really need visualizations of the data to make insights and discoveries. So in our project, what we wanted to do was really get at that, how do we let the public engage with visualizations of data and really practice that skill of making interpretations with data visualization. So the goal of the project, and again, the goal not being content, was how can we engage the public in using an authentic data visualization? And in this case, on the left, or right, I'm not sure what your screen is showing. Uh, there's the MIT Darwin Project. So this was a super computer-based model uh, based at MIT under the leadership of Mick Follows, where they had all the data about global plankton and then all of the data from NASA and NOAA on ocean conditions. So it's a very advanced simulation that scientists use to understand how marine microbes, AKA plankton, are living in the world's oceans. What's the diversity? Um, what's their distribution? So it's a really advanced scientific tool that scientists are using. And we wanted to adapt that into something that our museum visitors could use. So that was kind of, you know, the goal not being content where we really emphasized that the goal was to get visitors to use a current scientific tool. And we wanted them to be making their own observations and interpretations of a current scientific tool. So that another thing that's kind of different about science museums is, you know, we need to use a lot of what I would call nonverbal communication. It's not all words. It's not, there's not a narrator. So how do we use nonverbal communication as part of our sort of communication design? Here's an example where, you know, we put it on a tabletop. Well, what is this? How is this nonverbal communication? Well, this is, first of all, inviting any visitor to explore. It's not on a wall. So it means that someone in a wheelchair or somewhere in very young can look at the North Pole. So that, that tabletop is showing, we'll, I'll show more about this exhibit, but it's showing a visualization of global plank, plankton distribution. And those are little lenses where it will show what plankton is living there with little call outs. And I deleted the movie when we were having technical difficulties, but basically when you put it on a flat tabletop, you're inviting more than one user. So you're fostering like sort of the social aspect. You're allowing that any visitor, you know, whatever their height or mobility can use your exhibit. You're also making it so that they are like is an open range for exploring. So those are, that's just one example of kind of like how you might implement your design. We also added these lenses. So we actually found a way we had an incredible programmer from UC Davis named Isaac Liao who made it so that we basically could pull up the underlying data. So we, we, he made it so these little lenses, actual glass microscope lenses, would pull up what kind of plankton were living in a specific region. So when you move this little lens around, it would pull up the plankton. So what is that 
what does that mean? How is that non-verbally communicating? Well, it's an actual glass lens. We outfitted it with um, special sensors so it would pull up information, but that is showing you, oh, well, I didn't really know what the swirling colors were, but oh, I see these little microscopic things. Oh, now I know it's about microscopic life. You're using the lens as sort of a, a tool to help them understand their zooming. You're also using these icons, which were based on sort of real microscopic images to communicate that it's something small and it's moving around. So these are just like a few of the examples of ways that you can communicate non-verbally with an exhibit. Now, one thing that I think we can't do this with every exhibit, but especially because this was a well-funded project, and I think this is something that's quite different about museum exhibits, is we get input at every step. So it's not just evaluating at the end. And this slide is just showing, you know, at the upper corner, there's the two scientists using the Darwin Project all the way down to museum visitors using it on the floor of the museum. You go through a lot of iterations and troubleshooting to get input from visitors along the way. So I'm going to show a few different examples of that. So one of the reasons we're able to do that is we're very lucky at our museum. We have a group called the Visitor Research and Evaluation Group. And I usually partner, and a lot of this work is done by uh, Joyce Ma, who's a learning scientist. So we have PhD learning scientists who study how people learn from exhibits the way that Dominique and her team might be studying how people use different forms of communication. So they help us with sort of three different kinds of evaluation. I don't think you're going to be quizzed on these terms, but just so you know, in case you ever hear them, a front end is at the front of the project or the beginning. And that's really what do people already know and what are they interested in? So before you even start designing your, your exhibit, you need to know, do they, okay, in this case, do they know what plankton are? Do they know the term marine microbe? Do they know that they live in the ocean? What do they care about? What's interesting to them? So you're really trying to ground what you're creating in what your visitors are interested in or already know. Formative evaluation, really, I, you can think of as prototyping. Literally, you can be testing every different aspect of your exhibit. So what are people doing? Do they understand it or not? It, it, you can choose almost any facet. Like, do people know how to use the lens? Do people know what the colors mean? Are people, do they know there's a button there? You can really test for anything. And the summative evaluation at the end, or kind of the summary this is often only done if there was a large grant and you need to assess it, but ideally you're also seeing at the end of the design, did people really learn what you wanted them to learn or do what you wanted them to do? So just again, with this case study, a few examples, on the front end, we Joyce and her team collected baseline knowledge about what people knew about marine microbes or plankton. You know, did, oh yeah, large majority, um, we're aware that there are microscopic organisms in the water, you know, so it, it helped us ground, you know, those summary of key findings. There were a few pages of that where we sort of got a baseline of what do our visitors know or not know so that we're not designing something that's going to be completely confusing. And that sort of word cloud is when Joyce asked, you know, where would you want to explore? If you wanted to like explore different things about marine microbes, where would you want to go? And you can see overwhelmingly the people picked the poles. Um, so that also factored into our design. We made sure we included the poles and made the poles accessible because we knew that that was something visitors were interested in. Formative evaluation really is prototyping, which especially if some of you are engineers, I know Claire mentioned some of you might be engineering students, this is critical to the Exploratorium and that image of that machine shop, we are very, very lucky. We have a huge machine shop where our exhibit designers work. We also have a multimedia shop and a really critical part of our philosophy is to develop lots of prototypes. So you can see that image with the two stools. That was a very, very early prototype of what became that large um, data visualization table. It's like, okay, well, if we put something on a screen and let people interact with it, do they even want to do it? Does it seem interesting? We, we take things out early and often at every step to really get a sense of what people want to do, whether they're understanding what they're looking at. And that little image on the lower corner with the lenses, you know, those lenses that we put on... Did people know they could touch the lenses? Do people move the lenses around? Do they know how to open the call out? So 
this is where I would feed in kind of the cost element. You know, a typical exhibit, a simple exhibit can be maybe like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars by the time you include all the staff hours. You know, you think of just paying salaries. And a really technological exhibit can be much more expensive than that. So prototyping, unlike a news story or something that might be a couple of days work, we test it a lot because there's a large investment. And then this is something that is not as much for those of you just wanting to communicate, but that I do think is a really unique feature of what we and a lot of other museums do. And that is, especially when you have learning scientists as your partners or on staff, you can actually do research to inform the fields. <laughs> so the top screen, so this Living Liquid project was not just creating exhibits, but Joyce led a research study and that top segment is her software screen where you know they had, they knew where people were putting their fingers on the touch table. They had video, we had cameras everywhere. We have an IRB protocol so we can have human subjects research. And then that pane with all the software, she had a coding scheme. There was inner rater reliability. These are all things that I'm guessing the communications and psychology researchers understand. But we really dissected, you know, what do people do when they first get to the exhibit? What are they looking at? And then Joyce leads writing papers that we disseminate not only to the learning sciences and museum field, but the computer science field has also been really interested in this work because they're interested in how visualizations work and they don't have 2,500 people a day to 5,000 people a day coming in. So what I think I find exciting about some work in museums and we have this capability is that we also can do research on how people learn and that can not only improve our exhibits, but the exhibits of a lot of other, you know, museums around the world. So uh, this was an example of a finding. So like, what do you find in these research? So when Joyce analyzed that plankton exhibit, um, and you know had her coding scheme the orange little blobs are basically when a visitor made what was called a decoding comment oh what does the purple mean what does the orange mean what is this lens they were trying to decode the exhibit the purple was what we really wanted them to be doing which was interpreting the data oh the diatoms are living at the pole in the summer oh look there are more diatoms off the coast that was where we wanted them to get and one of the insights that was made when we did all this research was that it, even after all this prototyping and design with some of the best visualization experts consulting us, it still took people almost a minute to get to interpreting the data. And so this tells us we really need to work at figuring out how to help people better interpret visualizations. And, you know, it will help our museum colleagues as well. So those... Uh, I think the important thing to think of too, when I talked about exhibits versus exhibitions, so you can see in the end product there is that little lit up single exhibit that we talked about, where we talked about the goal was to get people to, to do more of a practice of science, which was engaging with the data visualization a bit more over content and using all these design factors like a table, a lens, different colors to communicate things we wanted to highlight and testing it. But these individual exhibits, again, live within a broader context. So you can see that that plankton population's kind of data table, they're all lit up in the lower part of the image, but it's housed within a much larger show. So that's the thing, museum exhibits always live in a context. We just can't control the way people are using all of the different pieces. Uh, so just you know, to summarize, some of the ways museum exhibits can differ from other forms of commu science communication really often the goal is not content. And that is hard to get your head around sometimes. I love content. I mean, I could read biology books all day especially, but they're really, it's really an opportunity for us to engage people in other ways of thinking about science. Um, more than other mediums, we use a lot of no verbal, nonverbal communication, and we use a lot of evaluation. And I think part of that is because, you know, exhibits, are used by hundreds of thousands of people a year, four years, and they're costly. So I think what I also wanted to touch on before talking more with you, hearing your questions about exhibits, are opportunities for scientists to engage with the public at museums. So I think, you know, this is a picture of our After Dark program every Thursday night when we're not sheltered in place. We have these adult evenings. So those are really, that's just a picture of these really well-attended public programs. 
the museums, you know, it's hard for a scientist. If you are a practicing scientist, you're learning about science communication, maybe you can write for the school paper or you can write a blog post or a social media post, but really you have very little access to the public. You have very few opportunities to engage with the public. And what I wanted to highlight is that museums or your local visitor center, they really can be an opportunity for you to engage directly with the public. And some of the things, examples I'm going to give are from a project we're doing with uh, University of California, San Francisco, Stanford, and Berkeley called so a very large center that we're part of called the Center for Cellular Construction. So a few ways that we've engaged scientists with the public are, you know, lectures and panels. And some of these might be really familiar, but here's the head of the center, Wallace Marshall, giving a talk on extreme cell biology. Well, you can see, you know, there are hundreds of people there that want to hear about, you know, how, what we know about cells and what are some of the bizarre things that cells do. So lectures, panels, those are ways that like practicing scientists can directly engage with the public. We often also host hands-on demonstrations. So this was Manu Prakash's lab has these paper microscopes called fold scopes. At our, on the weekends with family groups and in the evenings, we have these make and takes where people come make fold scopes. We provide samples. So a lot of scientists make demos for us and then come do the demos with the public. Um, we also, another opportunity you might have and that we often provide is when we have special events, like every year we have Latino Engineering Day. The whole event is in Spanish. Um, we work with a lot of professional societies and bring in Spanish speaking scientists to do programs where, you know, we do it all the time. But this was one particular example where we work hard to bring in scientists who can do Spanish programming. And that's a great opportunity, again, for a scientist to engage directly with the public. And then, you know, we have a special intern program as part of that grant. And these are just some of the interns, you know, they come and give their posters and we give feedback on how to present science in a way that's clear and understandable. They come up with their own demos. They do programs with the public. So that's also potentially, you know, an opportunity in different settings you may have in Wisconsin or in other places that you live. Maybe I don't, not right now, but doing internships is a great way to practice and learn science communication as well. And so with that, you know, I definitely want to make sure there's time for questions. You can email, feel free to email me. And I wanted to thank both my team and all the scientists we work with and our funders. But with that, I will happily take questions.